Combinatorial libraries are typically quite large and require selections. There are some cases, such as with RBS libraries, in which the libraries aren't too big for screening. You need to calculate the theoretical diversity during design of your experiment and determine what type of screen or selection is required. The oldest method is CELEX, which can be used to identify RNA or single-stranded DNA sequences that bind to a chemical or protein target. You begin with a library of DNA or RNA, typically with 10 to the 15th membership, generated by enzymatic processing of oligonucleotides with, dege with degenerate bases, as we discussed earlier. You also need a column in which the target is immobilized. One method involves mixing cyanogen bromide treated agarose beads with a protein target to get it covalently attached, but there are other strategies. You pass the library over the column and very rare members will bind specifically to the target and become immobilized. Most of the library, greater than 99% of the members, will flow right through the column and they can be discarded. You then elute the bound DNAs from the resin and amplify them by RT-PCR. That gives you a new library of DNAs that can be reverse transcribed for another round of selection. You often have to perform CELEX multiple times. There is a great deal of nonspecific binding during this process, so not only are the specific hits carried through in each round, you are simply enriching for these hits. Typically it takes around five or six rounds of selection to see a signal, but if all goes well and you have hits, you'll eventually get to a point where more of the material begins appearing after elution. At this point, you would clone the library, pick individual members to sequence, and then characterize those hits further individually. New improvements to CELEX involve using microfluidic platforms for improved enrichment, and as we'll talk about in the multiplex lecture, applying deep sequencing to characterize the hit pool. Before we see some additional examples, let's discuss the concept of enrichment. These terms, enrichment, specificity, and recovery, are quantitative measures of changes in the diversity of a library towards a subpopulation of hits. Enrichment is the main one, which is just the frequency of your hits within the final population divided by their frequency in the initial population. Enrichment is determined by the specificity and recovery. Specificity is how well the selection prefers the hit over the non-hit, while recovery quantifies how efficient the selection is at retaining the hits. Typically, you don't need to worry about specificity and recovery since they are rolled into enrichment. So let's do an, experiment, an example of how enrichment is calculated. The calculation of enrichment requires that you follow the frequency of the hits within your population before and after selection. Let's consider the scenario of a cell that turns fluorescent red when a hit is present and is blue otherwise. If we dilute and plate around 100 colonies of the naive library on a plate, we can count the red and blue colonies and then calculate the frequency of reds in the population. Now we apply a selection such as a fact sorting and repeat the plating experiment. Now we see that the frequency of reds is much higher. If we take the frequency after selection and divide by the frequency before selection, we get the enrichment, which here would be 92. To apply selections for binding to peptides and proteins, there is a challenge of connecting up the DNA and coding the protein with the protein molecule. Phage display is one of the earliest and most commonly used strategy for doing this. The M13 phage particle is a long filamentous object which looks ultimately more like a pencil than what is illustrated here. The P8 protein coats the sheath of the particle and can be used for multivalent display of very short peptides, like less than 8 amino acids in length. It doesn't tolerate longer proteins. Longer proteins can be presented at single copy by fusion to the P3 protein at the tip of the particle. Operationally, you would begin the experiment with a phage mid that encoded the P3 protein. A phage mid is just a plasmid that has an additional cis element required for packaging the DNA into an M13 particle. Otherwise, it's just like a normal pug plasmid. You would make your library by fusion of things to P3, as you have done before in one of the tutorials. You'll transform that library of phage mids into E. coli, and typically you can make up to 10 to the 11th member libraries with this approach.
The remainder of the M13 gene functions are provided by a helper phage. It's basically a slightly crippled variant of M13. You infect the library with helper and the progeny will be primarily packaged within the phage mid DNA and display the P3 fusion protein. You can then purify this phage material from the culture by precipitation and subject it to various selections. The panning experiment used to select for peptides, antibodies, or the like that bind to a target of interest from a phage display library are very similar to CELEX. Because the particles are large, they tend to get stuck in agarose beads, so you typically do phage selections within the wells of a maxisort plate, such as is used for ELISA assays. You immobilize your target to the surface of the wells of the plate, block it with milk or BSA, and then add your library. If your phage binds, it will become immobilized and won't wash off. You can then elute and infect the recovered particles onto E. coli to amplify them for subsequent rounds. The enrichments observed for phage display are similar to those of CELEX, so you will typically need to do multiple rounds of panning to enrich for the hits away from the nonspecific binders. Here is one of the more successful uses of phage display for identifying zinc finger proteins that bind to specific three base pair DNA sequences. On the left is the crystal structure of a three finger zinc finger protein bound to its DNA. The DNA is shown as a space filling model and you are looking down the barrel of the helix. The yellow balls are the zinc atoms, one of which binds to each finger. So you can see that specific regions of the fingers contact the DNA. Below, we zoom in on the regions of contact with the DNA, showing the specific residues of contact. The attractive features of zinc fingers that encouraged this experiment was the consistency of the contact residues from finger to finger. They always use more or less the same residues that contact the DNA. At right is the sequence of a three-finger zinc finger protein. The underlined regions are those contact residues, and in this study the authors apply saturation mutagenesis to those residues. They display the variant zinc finger proteins on the surface of M13 phage, and then perform panning against short DNAs that differ at one triplet. By doing this experiment at different triplets and seeing what gets pulled out, they were able to abstract out rules for designing zinc fingers specific to many specific DNA sequences, forming the basis for modern zinc finger nucleases. More recently, similar experiments have been done with tau proteins. Damn it. The most common use of phage display is for antibodies. Companies that make antibody drugs like Genentech generate their therapeutics in this way. There are other scaffolds such as aphobodies, nanobodies, and monobodies that do similar things to antibodies. The immunological properties of antibodies are unmatched by another scaffold, and these are therefore the most popular scaffold for therapeutics. By using fancy variations on library fabrication, it is possible to reconstitute the space of human-derived naive antibodies in vitro and display them on phage. Because of this, phage display has largely eclipsed mouse immunization since you get something out of the experiment that can be directly used in humans without further engineering. Phage display also has the advantage here that some targets, particularly those associated with cancer, often do not elicit immune responses in animals. Many of the epitopes upregulated in cancer are associated with early embryonic development, and the antibodies to these targets are eliminated as self-reactive members. So they have already been eliminated from the B cell population, and you don't see them. When you do the experiment in vitro, there is no such constraint, and antibodies can be made against any target. The major limitation in using phages is the need to transform your DNA into E. coli. This bounds the diversity you can access to 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 11th variants. Also, it becomes logistically more involved to use cells than it is to work in vitro. Therefore, people have developed various in vitro strategies for linking genotype to phenotype, and ribosome display is the most prevalent of these methods. You start with a DNA encoding your gene of interest under a T7 promoter that lacks a stop codon. You transcribe these DNAs in vitro with T7 RNA polymerase to generate an mRNA population, and then put this into an in vitro translation mix. Ribosomes will stall when they reach the end of the mRNA, forming a complex that links the nascent peptide to the mRNA. You can pan with these complexes just as you would in phage display.
After selection, you reverse transcribe the mRNA to DNA, PCR, and then repeat until you see binding, and then you clone and sequence. Another strategy for binding-based selections is cell surface display. Here you will decorate the surface of the cell with the protein encoded on a plasmid within the cell to couple genotype and phenotype. It can be done in multiple organisms including E. coli and yeast, and different systems are useful for different things. Shown here is yeast display. You fuse your gene to this protein, AGA2, which gets exported and deposited on the surface with disulfide bonds. This yeast system can handle full-length proteins, but the transformation efficiency of yeast limits the library to 10 to the 7th members. The E. coli systems are all based on inserting or fusing a peptide into a cell surface display protein. There are many such systems, including OMPX and CPX, which are outer membrane barrel proteins derived from E. coli. Probably the most robust is ice nucleation protein. You can reliably display peptides up to 80 amino acids on the surface, but longer proteins have a much lower success rate. In this version, they are placing an X2CX7CX2 peptide in a loop of the protein. They show that the disulfides are helpful in constraining the conformation of the peptide, resulting in better hits. It is possible to do selections with magnetic beads or maxisorb plates, but such experiments often result in the selection of flocculating mutants or weak binders due to the multivalent display. So in practice, that strategy is unlikely to work. Instead, you label the surface of the cell with a fluorescently tagged version of your template and then sort the fluorescent cells with a cytometer. Such reagents can be made by cloning your gene into an overexpression vector, expressing it in some cell, purifying the protein, and then reacting it with Fitzy, Tritzy, or some other reactive dye. After several rounds of labeling and sorting, you get a fluorescent signal, and at that point you can clone and sequence your library. The remainder of these selection methods are all in vivo selections, meaning they are selections applied to live cells and they are somehow based on the survival of the cells. There is also a class of liposome and micelle based selections, but we'll save those for the multiplex lecture. The simplest one is complementation, which has been a staple of genetics since the 1950s. Much of what we know of biology comes from a process of generating mutants and then screening for DNA fragments that correct or complement them. For example, you might treat E. coli with radiation and then pick a bunch of colonies and try to grow each one on minimal media. If it is unable to produce even one of its metabolites, the cell will be unable to grow in minimal media. You call such mutants oxytrophs. Usually the defect will, will be present in only one gene and introduction of a functional copy of this gene will restore growth. So if you transform these cells with a library of plasmids encoding fragments of the genome, or a genomic DNA library. Only those transformants that receive the functional copy will survive, and then you can sequence the plasmid to find out what you hit. That experiment falls under the category of forward genetics and is no longer so prominently used. The advent of genome engineering strategies allows you to knock out a gene directly now, allowing a more hypothesis-driven approach. When used in the context of genetic engineering, you employ complementation in a more targeted way. You construct a strain with the deletion in the activity of interest and then play with growth conditions until you find ones in which the wild type survives and the mutants die. You then make a library out of the knockout gene and perhaps with other proteins you think might satisfy the required function of this gene and you introduce that into mutant cells. You then grow the library under non-permissive conditions and collect your hits. Here is an example of protein engineering using a complementation selection by Hilbert. They begin with a charismate mutase knockout strain. This enzyme is involved in the biosynthesis of the aromatic amino acids, so mutants need to be fed aromatic amino acids like tyrosine phenylalanine to survive on minimal media. They then construct a library derived from the original gene. Wild-type charismate mutase is a domain swap dimer, and they examine the crystal structure to identify a site in which each monomer could be cleaved in half and then rejoined by a random linker. If the linker can satisfy the structural constraints, the topology of the enzyme would be changed, resulting in a monomeric version. The library contains six X sites, or NNK sites. They insert the library into the knockout strain and then grow it on minimal media. 
they pull out hits and then they go on and confirm that they are indeed monomers. Many people refer to the class of selections that involve linkage of a gene's function to its ability to grow as a genetic selection. Some folks use that term to more generally mean any selection that enriches for DNA sequences, and that would include in vitro methods like CELEX. In vivo selections is usually re reserved to specifically mean the condition in which the viability of the cell is linked to a target gene. There isn't a consistent name for what I'll call here a synthetic selection, but they involve some type of genetic circuit that links the target gene's activity, survival of the cell, in a more circuitous way. These methods are often the only way to probe the function of a gene, particularly when it is not a native activity of the cell. Let's look at an example of a synthetic selection. Let's say you want to engineer the substrate specificity of Luxar. Luxar is a transcription factor from Vibrio fishery that binds to a homoserine lactone small molecule and in response activates transcription from the Luxi promoter. It's a component of quorum sensing systems and is a very popular gene in synthetic biology. You want to make a library out of the LUXR active site and then select for variants that respond to a different small molecule. There is no LUXR-like activity in E. coli natively, so there is no gene to knock out that it would complement, so those experiments are out. Perhaps you could do a panning experiment against the new substrate immobilized in a column, but that would be a selection for binding, not the combination of binding and trans transduction of the binding into a transcriptional signal, so that probably won't work either. The easiest solution here is going to be some type of synthetic selection. There probably are better micelle-based solutions to be developed, but of the existing technologies, an in vitro selection and in vivo selection uh, will do the job the best. Here, uh, the Arnold Lab has placed a chloramphenicol resistance gene downstream of LUXI. If a functional LUXR is present, then the LUXI promoter will turn on. If LUXI promoter gets activated, the cell will survive in the presence of chloramphenicol. So operationally, you would construct a strain with this PLUXI CMR cassette, usually on a plasmid, then introduce a library of LUXR variants on another plasmid, then select for survival on the small molecule here, which is C10HSL, and you'd sequence what survives. This type of genetic selection can apply to any transcriptional process. Whatever it is you want to select for, if it turns on a promoter in the end, you can hook it up to a selectable marker and make it selectable. That also applies to any singular interaction within a transcriptional activation process. Let's look at that. Here's another example, the two-hybrid system. The two-hybrid is a genetic selection based on recruiting an RNA polymerase to a promoter. There are prokaryotic systems available, but this is almost always done in yeast with the GAL4 promoter. The experiment takes advantage of the fact that eukaryotic transcriptional activation is largely a localization problem, and one simply needs to tether an activator near the promoter to achieve activation. The mechanisms of transcriptional activation in bacteria are more geometrically constrained, so prokaryotic systems tend to be less extensible than their eukaryotic counterpart. In the yeast 2 hybrid, you start with the GAL4 promoter in front of various selectable markers. Yeast selections are usually based on metabolic complementation rather than antibiotic resistance genes, but they are morally equivalent. If the gene turns on, the cells selectively survive. The transcription factor that normally activates GAL4 is split into separate DNA binding and activation domains, DB and AD respectively in the figure. Each domain is fused to your protein of interest, shown here as X and Y. If X and Y form a protein-protein interaction, then the activation domain is recruited and transcription results. So let's say you wanted to identify an alpha body that bound to some particular protein Y. You'd engineer a cell that expresses Y fused to AD and the GAL4 promoter driving the selectable marker. You'd encode the DB fused to your library of alpha bodies on a plasmid, then transform. You grow the resulting cells under selective growth conditions, and only those alpha bodies that bind to Y should survive. So this is an example of using a synthetic circuit to do the same sort of selection that would more typically be done in using phage display.
Any aspect of this circuit can be subjected to a library. For example, you might alter the DNA sequence below DB and make a library of DNA binding domains such as a zinc finger library and select for their ability to bind to a different DNA sequence. Synthetic selections and genetic selections have only been constructed for a handful of systems. Another successful one is with suppressor tRNAs. These selections form the basis for most work in site-directed incorporation of unnatural amino acids. Here you place a TAG stop codon, or the AMBER stop codon, somewhere in the gene for a selectable marker. Here it's chloramphenicol acetyltransferase, which confers resistance to chloramphenicol. When the ribosome reads the mRNAs of this gene, it encounters the stop and prematurely terminates, and the cells are unable to grow on media containing chloramphenicol. If you introduce a library of suppressor tRNAs that may decode that uh, TAG codon, uh, those tRNAs will need to have a CUA anticodon, and a subset of the library may get charged with an amino acid and allow decoding of the amber stop codon leading to the full-length product and survival of the cell. Thus, you can select for functional suppressor tRNAs. You can construct a synthetic selection for any situation in which you can link the function of interest to expression of a selectable marker. You can control expression of a selectable marker at the DNA level, such as selection for recombinases, or at the transcriptional level, uh, and that can be transcriptional initiation, such as promoters, but it could also be elongation or termination. Uh, or it can be done at the translational level. So amber suppression is an example of translational control during elongation, but you can also do selections based on translational in initiation or termination. For example, you could place riboregulators upstream of a selectable marker that hides the ribosome binding site, and then select for RNAs or proteins that disrupt the secondary structure and reveal the RBS and thereby allow translation to initiate. Thus far, we've considered exclusively direct selections. The aptomers bound to the beads during selects and survives, the bait protein bound to the prey in the yeast 2 hybrid, and the tRNA suppressed the mutation and survived. Everything was direct. In some cases, what you're trying to identify from a library is not this activity, but rather this activity conditioned on some constraint. For example, you might want a tRNA that suppresses amber stops, but it only does so when an aminoacyl tRNA synthetase is, is exogenously added. Or you might want a transcription factor that activates a promoter in the presence of a small molecule, but you may also want to require that it does not activate the promoter when the small molecule is absent. For these sorts of situations, the established way to do it is a dual selection. However, with the ad advent of deep sequencing, there are new approaches which we'll discuss in the multiplex characterization lecture. In a dual selection, you start with a synthetic selection, but your selectable marker can be positive, as we did before, or negative, meaning we have a reporter gene that when activated will kill the cell. Such experiments also require a stimulus. In the case of the tRNA that requires a specific synthetase, that stimulus would be the synthetase or a synthetase gene. In the case of the transcription factor that requires a small molecule, the stimulus is the small molecule. You perform dual selection in two rounds. You first apply the positive selection in the presence of the stimulus, and then you withhold the stimulus and apply the negative selection. Let's go back and examine the Arnold study as an example, because actually in this study they do a dual selection. So I've changed the diagram here to indicate that the selectable marker is not just a cat gene, it's going to be a little genetic circuit that can be selected for or against in a dual selection experiment. For positive selection, they employ the Luxi cat construct as discussed before. For the negative selection, the Luxi promoter drives the blip gene encoding a beta-lactamase inhibitory protein. They also provide a constitutively expressed beta-lactamase gene in the cell. The selection strain here is ampicillin resistant. However, if Luxi is activated, blip is expressed, beta-lactamase is inactivated, and the cells die on the antibiotic. So you can select against a functional Lux R using this negative selection. Operationally, they first apply the on selection in the presence of their new small molecule C10HSL, they then apply the negative selection in the presence of the old small molecule, 3OC6HSL. And if 
if you just apply the positive selection in such experiment, you tend to pull out many variants that are constitutively on either by responding to an endogenous metabolite or by an internal conformational change. However, when you include the negative selection, the only things that can pass both selections are the ones specific to the small molecule.